Hello, everybody. This is Jay Bruce inviting you to go lion hunting the easy way. But first, let me introduce my canine helpers, essential partners in the lion hunting game. This is my first lion dog, Eli, across Collie and Airedale. He started hunting lions when he was less than a year old. He got 40, I got 41 lions with him before I got Ranger, my first hound. He was an open trailer that he bayed on the trail. Got 280 lions before I retired him. Bruce, son of Ranger, who was purchased from me when he was a pup by Senator Sanborn Young, named after me and then given back to me. We, here we pack in 16 miles into the Sespe River Company of, of Ventura County, 16 miles from the end of the road. Several young dogs <laughs> don't like the idea of swimming that stream, but they have to do it. We make camp under the shelter of a live oak tree and have flapjacks for breakfast the next morning. This is not very thrilling, but it's absolutely necessary. And start on the hunt. Now, when we start lion hunting, we don't expect to go out and watch for a seat, look for a lion. We expect to look for tracks to locate the lion's beat, because the lion itself does most of the traveling during the nighttime and beds down during the day. Lions who travel 25 miles during a night unless they make a kill somewhere on the way. And when they make a kill, they usually lay around it for a couple of days and catch up on lost meals. Here we, looking over the country, we select the country we think is most likely for a lion to hunt in. An area where there were deer, Plenty of brush. Of course, the dogs are always have their nose to the ground trying to get the scent of a lion, and I'm always watching for tracks too old for the dogs to smell. As I say, the first thing is to locate a lion's beat. Oh, here's where a den that was occupied by a hibernating bear. The bear, 80 pound yearling, was down below the roots, below the ground level. Lions always travel over rough country. Here's a quail's nest containing only eight eggs. There should be 16. Something must have disturbed the quail and drove her away from the nest. And here's what it is, king snake. We've been feeding on the eggs. This is uh, Pinon Blanca, White Rock country, the Sespe River Valley. This is Swallow Rock. Hundreds of swallows that nested in the uh, coves of the rock. Seem to get along pretty well together, though. Here we're heading for a valley up above this fall. Been an old deserted homestead there with apple trees and grass for the deer to feed, apples for the deer to feed on in the winter and fall and grass in the spring. Here we have to go down a reef of rocks back to the creek because it's too rough to go the way we're going. And there's a lion track, but it's several days old. The track of a big male about four inches across each way. Just a big cat track. Pointed toes and the corrugated heel of the cat family. The lion's probably headed for this old orchard. Now there's a deer. Like a fork and horn buck. And 
And here's where the lion had dragged the deer a couple of days before and covered it with leaves. Now, you see, instead of cutting the throat of the lion, as the storybooks say, and drinking the blood, the lion always disembowels it. The thinnest skin or hide on any animal is in the flanks and, and uh, groins. The lion strikes the deer down, then tears them open to thin his place and devours the liver first. This one had been gone for a day or so and gone away to a bedding place. But the dogs ahead have seemed to have fresh tracks, and here's another one. Apparently the little brother to that buck. Probably never been separated in their life. The two lions, two deer killed in two days by one lion. The dogs have fresh scent ahead. Trailing the lion now to his bedding place. Lion tracks in the sand. And the lion had bedded at the rim of this bluff, and when he heard the dogs coming, he took off down over the bluff, choosing the roughest country he could find. Because the lion himself, as being a cat, is short-winded, and can't run or fight any great length of time on the ground. So he takes to a tree or some bluff where he can get out of the way of the dogs. Dogs are now on the fresh track, only a few minutes old. Here we follow. This is one of the dangers of lion hunting, is that one may slip or fall and be injured so we can't walk. Dogs are hot on the trail ahead. We ought to hear them barking treat any minute now. Hard on the seat of the pants. Here the lion is treed. Dogs are barking, telling the world about it. We hurry now to get there before the lion can be rested and ready to take off again. There's a big cat himself, about 50 feet up in a tree. While we were maneuvering around taking pictures of him, and the cat took a notion to jump jumped out and crippled one leg, was caught on the ground with the dogs and finally managed to get up this smaller oak tree. He's restless and wants to get away from there, but knowing he's injured, dare not try it. Trying to get a shot at him now. One shot, but he didn't kill him dead. I'm back up the tree again. The next one brings him down, though. And the dogs pitch in to ball him. Good boy, Ranger. There's the dog that caught the lion. See what the cat did to his head in about one swipe? The University of California wanted several specimens from this area 
so I'll have to carry this one out to where we can get to him with a horse. To the nearest trail. Weighed 150 pounds. This is, <clears throat> this is the safest way to ease him down over the rough places. We have to take him to camp because the university wanted the, the skeleton and the measurements and the hide and also the meat also furnished food for the dogs. I found out that any dog that refused to eat lion meat never makes a lion dog. You're leaving here so we can come back and get him, get him with a horse. Here's a hunt in the Sierras in Mariposa County on our way in. The body in this car was built by the Motor Body Corporation, Manuel Man Harris, president. On the way, we jumped some deer. They're not afraid of the car. There's a yearling doe that makes friends with, with us, so we put out some potato peelings and apples for her. She seems to appreciate it. There's a bear. Put on our hunting rig now and start the real hunt for the lion. First thing we see is a rattlesnake. Now you probably heard how Rattlesnakes love to bask in the sunshine. Now you watch this one and see what happens to it. And if you ever take a notion to capture a rattlesnake alive, take home for a pet, that's the way to do it. Show you his fangs now, about three-eighths of an inch long. Snakes only need about one feet a year to get by. They get three, they're living like a banker. Here we're putting him out in the sun to see what happens to him. <clears throat> He's trying desperately to reach the shade and we keep moving him back into the sun. After five minutes, you see, he can hardly crawl. Snakes are cold-blooded creatures. They cannot, they have no uh, sweat glands and cannot perspire to cool off like warm-blooded animals do. So they take on the temperature of their surroundings like a piece of metal or something and keep Absorbing the heat. This was uh, 94 degrees in the shade and 3,400 feet elevation. Seven minutes, he's stone dead and stiff. Rigor mortis set in as soon as he was dead. That's how snakes love to bask in the sunshine. Here's a bear den that was occupied by a hibernating bear when I discovered it. And got myself some bear meat and lard. Bear in California go into hibernation about Christmas time and come out about the first of 
April. There's the big bear's tracks in the sand beside the stream. Here's old Bruin himself. I wonder what he's hanging around here for. Maybe we'll find out. He gets our wind, but can't locate us. He's getting ready to charge, look out. Put it in the opposite direction. The young dogs begin barking and Bruin takes to a tree. Here's lion tracks, and where he ran, where he ran at a deer. There's the remains of the deer, and that's what the bear had been feeding on. That's what he was hanging around there for. Bears clean up most of the remains of kills done by lions. This track is pretty old, not too fresh, but the dogs are still interested in it. Here's where the lion tried to catch a couple of deer that were out in a little meadow, but to be in no cover, cat couldn't get close enough. Lion ass approached within 50 feet, say, of a deer, then make a rush at it, surprise it in order to capture it. See ranger smelling each side of the brush? That's the way the dogs tell which direction the cat has gone. That is whether they have a back trail. If the scent is fresh on the near side as they approach, they know they have the forward trail. On the other hand, if it, after passing a turn around and get the fresh scent on the opposite side, they know they have a back track because the lion himself pushes the twigs away in front of them. They slide back along by his side, leaves the scent on the near side as he approaches. This track is about 12 hours old, as near as we can tell, and I see it's a big male. My track's in the sand. A big male lion weighs 160 pounds, and a big female about 100. And their tracks are just about the same size comparatively. The hunter never expects to see a lion until it is treated or bathed by the dogs. Uh, we, we, in killing 669 lions, we trailed an average of about 15 miles a day we got the lion. This was over roots the lion had hunted over and during the night. Without the dogs to do the trailing, the person wouldn't have a chance to get a lion. In fact, most people who spend their lives in a lion country never get to have a glimpse of one because the big cats do their most of hunting at night and bed down in the amongst the rocks and brush in the daytime. Here we over trail over the next divide and down to the next fork of the river. If the dogs trail to the water's edge to make sure the cat didn't just go there for a drink and then double back. Not finding a double trail on these logs, the dogs trail right back to the water's edge again, the rushing torrent of melting snow water, making sure the lion went into the river. <coughs> Ranger tries to follow, but the current is too swift, and he has to come out on the same side. The same thing happened to the lion. First. When the dogs come out, they find the lion's track and trail him for a couple of hundred yards down the river to where it's it's wider and not so rough, the water not so rough. Making sure the lion went into the stream, dogs follow. Coming out the other side to pick up the tracks again and get the scent.
after trailing 12 miles, we don't want to lose the line just because the river is there. So after sizing up the situation, we figure we can make it all right and follow. People often ask me what happens to the gun, but it doesn't hurt it at all, a revolver. Doesn't even hurt the ammunition for the few minutes we're in the water. It's pretty cold in the stream, but we get warm fast enough when we start up that mountain on the other side. Lion tracks in the sand beyond us. Now here's where the lion ran at the deer. One jump. Two jumps turning to the right to head the deer. Three jumps and he brought down a 180 pound buck. You see, again, the lion uh, disemboweled the deer in order to kill it. Never touched the throat at all. All our lives we've heard about how lions cut the throat, or panthers cut the throat of deer and then suck the blood. I've never found one killed that way yet. In the hundreds I've found on the lion hunt. Lion disemboweled this deer and ate the liver as usual. To find out which way the lion has gone from there. Now they've got the tracks away. Lion is headed for water now because after having a feed, he wants to take a drink before bedding down. Went to this little pool and had a drink, and then went amongst these, up amongst these rocks and bedded down. But uh, when he heard the dogs coming, probably half an hour before, he took out of there and chose the roughest places he could find to throw the dogs off the track, doubling back and circling, especially doubling back. from one rough place to another. Dogs finally work him out of the rocks and he takes to the brush. Then to the logs. Here the lion went to the end of this log, then doubled back. The hounds followed the track to the end, but the silent trailer, Pete, got to... They sent where he jumped off the log and jumped off and took after him, doubled him back, and treated him. Now they're telling the world about it. Big cats are resting about 40 feet up in the tree. We're keeping out of sight so as not to disturb him. He's getting restless, so we better take a shot at him. Time 10 feet farther up when he sees us. Aim right at the spot behind his shoulder and squeeze the trigger. Good boy, Ranger. Ranger claims the kill, growls and fights the other dogs away. In fact, we have to tie two of them to prevent a free-for-all dog fight over the kill. Good boy, Ranger. See him wag his tail and praise him. We got him right through the heart. You notice how that lion went out of that tree when he was hit by that heavy bullet of a 38-40 revolver? In late years, I changed the 22 automatic because the lion never jumped out when struck by the low velocity light bullet, but it was merely just step around until he died a hemorrhage. Move around a little bit maybe to try to hide and then die up in the tree where the dogs couldn't get a hold of him. So I adopted the 22 or automatic pistol 
there's around about 200 lions. Big cat's track four inches across. Old Eli was 14 years old and he couldn't keep up with the hunt, but he finally got there. The ranger stepped back and let him take over. This was the old boy's last lion hunt. Well, sit down, take it easy. Ranger taking a well-earned rest. Here's a female lion I captured for the Oakland Zoo. I didn't have the camera along when I captured her. After having her several trees, she went under a big rock, and I had to crawl under there and get a rope on her neck and drag her out, and then over to a bush and take several turns around a young tree, and then stretch her out so she and tie her feet together and get this rope with a collar on her. Try and tame her a little now. Now she thinks she's hiding, she'll go in there easy enough. It was a 70-pound female. Nice kitty, yeah. Here we struck the track of it female and trailed her to where she killed a coat in a pasture, and she left the coat untouched, never ate a bite, and went up in the ridge and killed a doe, and was still hanging around that when we jumped her and ran her five hours, and the dogs treat her. Then I discovered she'd been nursing kittens, so the next day I went back with two dogs that hadn't been in on the hunt this day and didn't know we killed this lion and backtracked her to this kind of a den among the rocks. There were three kittens. The dog killed one before he could catch them and tie them. So I went down amongst the rocks to try to corner the others and okay. In the meantime, they sneaked away to another hiding place. See, the young of all the wild cats are spotted. That is, they're spotted when they're young. I'd brought along a sack this day, expecting to find the kittens if I could backtrack the mother. So now having them cornered, knowing where they were cornered, I sneak up on them. Sneak up on them here, this way. We only have them cornered here, now we can get them. Worth only twenty dollars for male and thirty for a female and bounty is dead and worth a hundred dollars alive for zoos. Like animated cactuses, they have claws and teeth about a half an inch long. Must be some way to get them in the bag, and here it is. Did we strike the tracks of another female? A couple of years later, and trailed to this bluff for rocks, where she stood off the dogs until I got close. Set off four dogs until I got up close, then she took off, and the dogs took after. And I went up to where she'd been fighting the dogs, and this is what I found. Three little kittens about two weeks old in the nest.
They have no teeth, but they have sharp little claws. After a couple of weeks, they take to their adopted papa. <whistles> Dinner time. Come on, this way. <whistles> That's the only sound I ever heard out of a mountain lion. The screams we hear tell about mountain lions entering is just imagination. Each one wants the first turn at the bottle. Here's a hunt, winter hunt, the snow, Fresno County. Took us four hours to go four miles getting in here, go over the summit. This is, uh, body is on the chassis of a Model T Ford. That all, every attachment that you could put on the Model T Ford. We make camp in the no deserted homestead house. First thing is you have to cut a few sticks of wood. They say if you chop your own wood, it'll warm you twice. This camp was 3,000 feet elevation. The lower edge of the lion country. Lions range between 3,000 and 5,000 feet in the northern, northern part of California, northern counties, and from about 4,000 to 7,000 in southern California. There are 21,000 miles of lion country, and we found one lion to the township when I began hunting. There were 600 lions in the state at that time. 600 townships in lion country. Started out with some young dogs to give them some experience. Look away up ahead, you see, band of deer crossing a trail. Top of the ridge here, about 5,000 feet. The snow was two feet deep, two feet of old snow and about six inches of new snow. Over the top and down the farther side, the south side. And here's a spur, which is a likely place for a big tomcat to travel. They usually follow the main spurs and main ridges and then blaze their trail by picking up little piles of muck along the way. And here's a track right now. Here, Pete. Here, Ranger. Here's the lion that tried to sneak on a deer around protection of this small bluff, but the deer got away. Saw him coming too far away and got away. He turned then down the hill to the creek on a regular beat, the lion does. Occasionally find a lion that won't tree but will bay, if he's, especially if he's already bedded in some secure place among the rocks, a place he thinks is secure, he'll stay there and fight it out. This one had bedded down up to near the top of a hundred foot bluff. We would go around on a kind of ledge so we could see the dogs fighting at him. Then I have to go back around and come down the way the dogs and lions came in. 
protect the dogs. Look out. It's right at the rim of the hundred foot bluff, all icy at the top. <clears throat> Cat made up his mind he's going to stick it out right here. But a well-placed bullet through his heart ends his career. Well, they usually carried along about 50 feet of quarter-inch rope, so if I found lions half-grown or smaller, I could capture them alive, since they were worse than much more alive. Hundred and sixty pounds of lion, the worst destroyer of deer life, the greatest destroyer. Here the dogs treat a forty pound kitten in a small tree. Decided to capture this one alive. He had him in half a dozen different trees before he finally took to this tree, which grew up against the one fork of it, came right up against the bluff. After several attempts in other trees, the cat finally gets used to the rope and stick and decides to take it. Down he comes. The idea now is to tire him out and then kneel down quickly with one knee on his neck and one on his hips and tie his feet together, but he has different ideas. This one had teeth and claws about three quarters of an inch long. He was big enough to kill a half-grown deer. Now we've got him, Walt. Now I'm showing you here the difference in the disposition of a lion after he loses all fear of man. Even those smallest kittens you saw, as soon as they become used to a, a human being not afraid of them, they'll walk up and spit in the hot face of the biggest hounds and try to pick a fight with them. This one's about six months old, and we'd had him about a month in captivity and feeding him ground squirrels, so I'm going to turn a couple of young dogs loose to tease him and see how he reacts to that. He's not a bit afraid of the dog. As soon as he gets used to a person, that leads me to believe that a lion tries to get away from a dog because they connect a dog up with mankind. And that's what they're really afraid of. But this lion would hear those dogs coming after him in the woods, and he was wild. He'd take him to the rocks or trees, and he'd out or climb the tree. As soon as he become used to, to me, lost all fear of me, he had no fear whatever of the dogs.
hope you folks have enjoyed the lion hunting. Now I'd like to tell you something about my book, Cougar Killer. It was written entirely by myself and contains information you never heard of before. In fact, the University of California is using it in classes in zoology and biology. It is illustrated by photographs taken on the actual hunt. I know you'll enjoy reading this book, Cougar Killer.